We all want to win arguments. I mean sure, there are probably those people out there that like losing arguments because that means that they've learned something, but usually, we want to look cool and smart in front of people that don't really care. I mean come on, I'd miss my own wedding if it meant winning an internet argument with some random guy in Nebraska. But in all seriousness, being able to analyze different arguments through logic will help us make important decisions in life. There's different life philosophies and self-help advice out there some conflicting with others. And perhaps by looking at all this advice more logically, we could come to our own conclusions. So this video is designed to provide a very basic elementary introduction to logic for someone who knows literally nothing about it. The text I'll be using, which I was taught in my logic class, is Harry J. Gensler's Introduction to Logic. Hopefully, if this video does its job and gets you more interested in logic, you can get the book yourself for further reading. Also, this video contains a lot of information, so feel free to pause it, take notes, go back to earlier sections, or whatever else you gotta do. Now, without further ado, let's actually start talking about logic. So first off, we should probably define logic. In contemporary culture, we kinda just use the word logic interchangeably with reason. If anything, the word is used as a political tool. You know, people will talk about how logical they are and their side is while the other side is illogical. They'll say their position is logical without even talking about its validity or anything. But what really is logic? Gensler defines logic as the analysis and appraisal of arguments. I think about logic less as a thing but as a method. A tool that you could use to look at arguments and determine certain things about that argument. We'll talk about those things later. But we might as well also understand what an argument is since that's what we're going to be dealing with when we do logic. An argument has two components. First, it has a set of premises, which can be seen as supporting evidence, and then a conclusion which is based on that evidence. Now you could have a lot of premises, I've seen them go up to more than a dozen personally. But for this video and for syllogistic logic, we're going to be dealing with two premises and one conclusion. Here's a more concrete example of an argument. All fish are animals, a salmon is a fish, therefore a salmon is an animal. Also, those three dots that form a triangle, that's just another way to say therefore. I just use it instead of writing out therefore because I'm lazy. So now we know what an argument is, and it might be helpful to think of some argument examples of your own. But we've only just begun. We've actually got to test these things. I mean, consider this example of an argument. McDonald's is healthy. All frogs creep me out. Therefore, biking should be illegal. I mean, it's technically in the form of an argument, but something seems seriously wrong here. And I'm not talking about the fact that I actually like frogs. So when we get an argument like this or any other, we have to put it through two different tests. We have to test whether an argument is valid and if an argument is sound. So let's start with understanding what a valid argument is. The book states, an argument is valid if it would be contradictory, impossible, to have the premises all true and the conclusion false. Valid doesn't say that the premises are true, but only that the conclusion follows from them. If the premises were all true, then the conclusion would have to be true. So to test for validity, we first don't concern ourselves about whether the premises are true. We kind of just assume them to be true for now. So even if we get ridiculous sounding premises like, all giraffes live on Mars, we don't worry about whether it's true. What we do worry about is the relationship to these assumed true premises and the assumed true conclusion, to see if the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. This might sound weird, so let's get an example going. All cats are evil. Garfield is a cat. Therefore, Garfield is evil. So again, it may or may not be true that all cats are evil, or if Garfield is a cat. But that's all irrelevant. We're only concerned here with whether the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. Now I'll explain an actual test to test for validity later in this video, but here's just an illustration I made to show how this argument is valid. All cats are evil, so the entire category of cats fits into the larger category of evil. Garfield is a cat so he fits into the cat category, and since the cat category is in the evil category, it necessarily follows that Garfield is evil. Therefore, this is a valid argument. But what about an invalid argument? What might that look like? Let's take a classic argument example and modify it a bit to make it invalid. All men are mortal. Socrates is immortal. Therefore, Socrates is a man. Now this might sound valid on its surface, but it's really not. Here's an illustration to show why. 
So all men are mortal. So the men category fits into the larger mortal category. Now Socrates is a mortal. And while that may mean Socrates can fit into the man category, he could also be somewhere else, like in this fish category, because fish are also mortal. So you see that even if it's possible for the conclusion to follow from the premises, it isn't necessary or forced. The conclusion must follow necessarily from the premises for an argument to be valid. So that's what a valid argument is. Again, I'm actually going to give you a way to test for validity later on in this video. But first I want to distinguish a valid argument from a sound argument. Now a sound argument doesn't need much explanation. Basically a sound argument is a valid argument, but the premises are also true. Remember how we don't really care if the premises are true when we test for validity? Well here we actually do care. An argument could be unsound in either two ways. One, it might have a false premise, or two, its conclusion might not follow from the premises. Here's the classic example of a sound argument. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. As you can see it is both valid as an argument and the premises are true. Don't worry yourself too much though about sound arguments or determining whether the premises are true, because in my experience, the majority of logic focuses around testing for valid arguments. A critical reasoning class might be better suited for judging if a premise is false or not. Anyway, now that we have distinguished between a valid and sound argument, let's now introduce a certain type of logic which is arguably the most famous and accessible. Shout out to Aristotle. It's surprising that we haven't talked about him yet on this channel, but he is the inventor of syllogistic logic. Now there are three parts to an argument in syllogistic logic, or syllogisms for short. There's the major premise, such as all men are mortal, there's the minor premise, such as Socrates is a man. Then there's the conclusion, such as Socrates is mortal. Pretty straightforward. The thing is though, when working with logic you're probably not going to be dealing with full words, but rather letters that represent a word. Usually you just substitute the word for the first letter. So instead of all men are mortal, you'd put all M is O. With O representing mortal, because we already have an M. But wait, why are we saying all M is O instead of all M are O? Well that's because there's specific language used for syllogisms. Specifically there are five words used in these sentences. Those words are all, no, some, is, and not. And when you combine the letters that represent a thing with these words, you get stuff like all F is H or no G is D. These are called well-formed formulas, but in class we just called them woofs for short. Here are some examples of woofs used in syllogisms, and underneath them are some non-woofs. Notice how the non-woofs underneath use language that isn't limited to our five words. Now there's also the issue of capitalization, because as you've probably noticed, some letters are capitalized and others aren't. So in each woof there are two letters. Now for the first letter, if the woof begins with a word such as some, all, or no, then both letters get capitalized. However, if the woof begins with a letter and not a word, then the first letter is lowercase. But in this second case where the first letter is lowercase, what do we do about the second letter? Well, if the term you're representing is a general term, then you use a capital letter. So for example, eats ice cream would be a capital E, and soccer players would be a capital S. Now if the term you're representing is singular and points to a specific person or thing, then you should use a lowercase letter. For example, amygdala vids would be a lowercase a, and Nietzsche would be a lowercase n. Now with all this in mind, see if you could convert this sentence here into a woof. Pause the video if you need to. Okay, assuming you pause the video and you have an answer, here is the correct answer. As you can see, we only use those five words that are available to us, and our letter capitalization meets the rules we previously established. Finally, now that we understand woofs and syllogistic logic, we can now go over a method for testing the validity of a syllogism. So let's start by converting this argument on the left into a syllogism using woofs. No rabbits eat meat. Bugs Bunny is a rabbit. Therefore, Bugs Bunny doesn't eat meat. For the first part, we could translate this into no R is E, with R representing rabbits and E representing eat meat. Remember, we capitalize both because this woof starts with a word. Next, we can translate the second part into B is R, with B for Bugs Bunny being lowercase because this woof begins with a letter, and R for rabbit being uppercase because it is a general term. Finally, we could translate this conclusion into B is not E. Alright, nice job guys. We have our syllogism. 
Next, we want to underline any letter that is distributed, but what does it mean for a letter to be distributed? An instance of a letter is distributed in a woof if it occurs just after all or anywhere after no or not. So here are some examples of distributed letters and woofs that are underlined. Again, pause the video if need be, but let's now look at our example. Since our first woof starts with no, any letter after that is distributed, so we underline both the R and the E. Our next line has no distributed letters according to our rules, so nothing gets underlined. Finally, for our conclusion, B is not underlined, but E is because it comes after the word not. So our syllogism with underlined distributed letters should look like this. Next, we need to star certain letters. Star premise letters that are distributed, and conclusion letters that aren't distributed. So for our example here, our first premise has both letters distributed, so we star both of them. None of the letters in our second premise is distributed, so nothing gets starred. Finally, in our conclusion, we only star B because it is not distributed. This is now what our syllogism looks like both distributed and starred. Last step here, we check if every capital letter is starred exactly once, and then we check if there is exactly only one star on the right hand side. So checking over our example, we see that R and E, our only capital letters, are starred exactly once. So it passes that test. Next we check if there is exactly one star on the right hand side. And there is on the E in our first premise. And since it passes those two tests, the argument is valid. The syllogism is valid if and only if every capital letter is starred exactly once and there is exactly one star on the right hand side. Now I don't expect you all to get this immediately, which is why I highly recommend the book if this stuff interests you, because there are also practice problems to help you fully grasp all this. As to why the star method works, I really don't know, and I would expect it to be extremely tedious to try and learn how, it just does in the end. But just to recap, hopefully you've learned what logic is the difference between a valid and sound argument, the basics of syllogisms and well-formed formulas or woofs as we've called them, and the star test to test for validity. Don't ask me to go further with logic because it's really not where I focus much in my education. However, just learning some basics has really helped me greatly in life. If you got any value out of this video, then feel free to subscribe and hit the bell to be the first ones notified when I drop another video. Hit the like button if you've learned anything, and I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you.